Hello again. I'm Judy Sedgman. Welcome to another edition of Innate Health, Eliminating Stress and Creating Healthier Communities. Today, I'm very fortunate to have as a guest a, a longtime colleague of mine, one of the most interesting and uh, dynamic psychiatrists that I've ever known, and a gentleman who can explain innate health and the principles behind it with, uh, with great clarity and wit. So I'm gonna welcome uh, my guest, Dr. William Pettit. And uh, I'm, today our topic is going to be primarily PTSD. Uh, this is such an, such an important topic at this time uh, when we have so many returning veterans, uh, when we have so many people traumatized by various things that are going on in our society right now across the world. And PTSD is, uh, is a problem that has bedeviled the mental health field. I'd have to say that uh, in the literature that we've read, it's, it's really difficult to feel hopeful about an answer. However, Dr. Pettit is very hopeful. And one of the things that I'm gonna ask you to do as you listen to him, because I had to learn this early on as I listened to him, uh, is that he challenges a lot of ideas that uh, you may take for granted, that we've gotten used to in life, that we kind of, uh, you know, we've heard so many times we think they must be the way it is. And I find in listening to someone who does that, to just listen with an open mind, knowing you can always go back to what you thought before, but give it a chance. And um, so with that, I'd like to welcome you, Bill. Well, thank you, Judy. It's really a, it's really a pleasure to be back here in Bradenton uh, area where I was uh, many yeah. years ago, 26 years ago. Yeah, yeah. that's where we yeah. met. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to start out by just asking you, what is the traditional definition of PTSD? What's the definition that we're all working on right, right now? Right. You know, um, I actually brought my DSM-4 because I wanted to get the wording at least at the beginning, and I'm certainly not going to read all of the criteria, but mm -hmm. but I'm going to read the 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 kind of the the core okay. thing of it. And uh, post-traumatic stress disorder: the person has to have been exposed to a traumatic event in which both of the following were present. Both the person experienced, witnessed, or was confronted with an event or events that involved actual or threatened death or, in, or serious injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of themselves or someone else that they were close to. So I have to be actually exposed to that. And the, and the person's response had to involve intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not just the exposure to the incident, but they have to have also had in their experience, which we'll, we'll talk about where that comes from yeah. later, um, uh, has to involve intense fear, helplessness, or horror. In children, this may be expressed by disorganized or agitated behavior. Yeah. But subsequent to that, um, it has to last at least for a month to be post-traumatic post stress disorder. And it has to uh, have symptoms of the following things. It has to, at least there has to be, the, the event has to be re-experienced. Uh, mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. This can be through nightmares, it can be through daytime flashbacks, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be re-experienced. There has to be, uh, because of the intense fear of re-experiencing, the person then has to avoid anything that reminds them of mm -hmm. that. You know, so, of course, many of our veterans that came back from uh, Vietnam could not watch many of the Vietnam, Vietnam War movies that, mm -hmm. that came mm -hmm. out after the war. They just mm -hmm. couldn't, and they would go away. Um, you know, I thought of even when I was a child, um, when we used to go up to Kalamazoo, Michigan, to visit my aunt and, and uncle and their children, the man next door was a World War II veteran. And we often went over the 4th of July weekend. Well, he, had to, he went to the countryside he never stayed fireworks. in town because of the fireworks, mm -hmm. because of, of fearful. So avoiding stimuli that would be associated with it. And the third is that there has to be a persistent, and we'll talk about later a term that you and I had talked about before from research, uh, of allostatic load, that, that the person has to have a persistent sense of hyperarousal, mm -hmm. of vigilance. I, I had a roommate... Uh, who was a Vietnam um, uh, veteran when I was in school. And, you know, my, my roommate, uh, other roommate, made the mistake of uh, doing something suddenly, and he flew out of his bed 
and and had him up against the wall with a you know with a, something uh, you know wow. and it, it, because there's this tremendous startle reaction. So mm -hmm. there has to be a hyper arousal mm -hmm. state that's manifested with uh, outbursts of anger, difficulty with sleep, different things. So so that's the core symptoms. The core symptoms are that there has to be this this event that that is very threatening. Then mm -hmm. there has to be a uh, re-experiencing and then there has to be avoidance and there has to be a, a startle, hyper startle mm -hmm. response. Yeah. Now in, in, I'm going to ask you how your definition would, uh, would sort of flow into that diagnosis, but I thought I'd to start out just so people will kind of understand where you're coming from. Right. Um, you've treated a lot of people with PSD, PTSD over the course of your years in psychiatric practice, I know, and I, I'm not asking for a number because right. that would be impossible, right. but I thought I just wanted to make certain people know that this is a diagnosis that you're very familiar with. Right. Yeah. yeah well, I have. You know, I was in the Navy for nine years, so, uh, and, uh, and, uh, saw a, a, and this was during the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. and uh, so I saw, and then through the years in private practice and then at uh, West Virginia University, I saw people from, uh, you know, World War II, from the Korean War, from, uh, and many uh, from uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, many uh, people who had um, had um, this experience uh, from, from sexual trauma, either as a child uh, being molested or as an adult uh, mm -hmm. uh, having traumatic sexual uh, mm -hmm. uh, rape or things mm -hmm. like that. So, um, so yes, I've treated um, many people from many traumatic situations uh, mm -hmm. that experienced uh, these symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, as you've described, what's required to 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 right. pr provide that diagnosis. Uh, when you look at people with with um, PTSD, what is it from the perspective of innate health? And you can ground that however right. you wish to. But right. what is it that you see right. uh, that that is different? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. The symptoms. Are, I mean, the the criteria are the criteria. I mean, right. the, the, that that doesn't change for right. me at all. Right. What what changes for me is the hope that I have that the person can come back, uh, that number one, that there's a place within them that has not been scarred, has not been touched, is inviolate, violet, is that the word? Be inviolate, inviolate yes. yeah, is, is whole, that, uh, and that can be re-accessed. I, I, as you know, I like Bob Dylan uh, yeah. a lot, and, and, and Bob Dylan has a, a one line uh, that says, you know, we can uh, we can come back, but we can't come back back all the way. Well, I think that's the the that would when applied that line when applied to post traumatic stress disorder would be what this what the standard is that you can come back, but you can't come back all the way. And I would say that's just not true. That you can come back all the way because there is a a, a, a place of mental well-being within the the soul, the the heart, the the being of a human being that is that can't be it can't be injured, it can't be touched, and and that's that's what gives me hope when I see uh, when I see uh, somebody who's having these symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, that they can come back all the way. Um, you know, it's interesting. The, the um, first of all, it's it's very interesting. Even in the criteria, that the, both of those things have to be um, occur. That the person has to have this experience, but then also has to experience this horror and this helplessness, which which must mean that not everybody does. Everybody, not everybody does, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, even if, if, if people would even look that, that, that it's, it's, it can't totally be the outside event. Right. Because, because even there's variation. And, um, uh, and it's very interesting. I was listening to um, a program on my monthly uh, thing that I receive uh, that um, was saying that in the United States, in the United States, this is not in... Cambodia or you know somewhere where there's been constant war or turmoil in the United States 70 percent of the population has had an event in their life that would qualify for post-traumatic stress disorder Wow 70 percent Wow that's amazing it's amazing isn't yeah. it but only seven the incidence in the United States is about appro approximately seven percent 
mm -hmm. of the people. And now I, I always forget incidence, prevalence, prevalence, yeah. incidence. Well, whatever. Whatever. Incidence will do. It. Yeah. <laughs> about seven percent. So yeah. So that about one tenth of the people that experience. Uh, a tra traumatic yeah. event, something that meets this criteria, uh, only about one-tenth of those people experience the persistent symptoms. And, and, and it would seem that, that people would be wondering about that, you know? I mean, and yeah. people have wondered. Yeah. They've wondered that, that even something as traumatic as, um, as, uh, as, as rape, uh, at, at, at 30 days, I saw one said 96% of the people met criteria. Mm -hmm. But at 90 days, only 46% did. Hmm. And then later, 36 Well, something's happening there that some people are accessing, mm -hmm. are reaccessing something that they're getting back. Yeah. And, 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 and we, they may not be, all of those may not be getting back all the way, but there's some internal capacity to re reach mental well being mm -hmm. that people are accessing to varying degrees. And, and the hope in the field, even uh, Dr. Um, Shalib from Israel, that is one of the internationally known, and I, and I talked to him over the phone a couple of times. He, He's always said, well, come visit me. And I said, no, you come visit me. <laughs> but he's much more famous than I, you know, I'm not famous. So, so I think it's probably the burden for me to visit him. But he, he in his chapter in the National uh, Post-Traumatic uh, Stress uh, PTSD Handbook uh, that edited by Dr. Friedman from the National, he says, he said that there, if anyone ever found principles uh, that allowed people to, he says, obviously people, there are some people reaccessing something innate. And, and his question was, if we could ever find a way to do that on a more consistent basis, then uh, it would be tremendous. Yeah. You know? and, and, and you have said earlier, and if I get rambling too much, stop me. Just yeah, please will. do, or yeah. get going too fast. Um, I, I'm passionate about this because... Um, I see a lot of people. I see a lot of people in what I think is needless pain. Yeah. And innocently, I think that our profession has, and I'm just going to be honest, uh, you know, in my sure. and say it's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, in innocently have made things more painful for people. We, not because they wanted to make them, you know, they wanted to help them, but, but they've made it harder for people to come back by um, the things that we've done supposedly as therapy. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that's, I think that's, I don't know, I think that's really sad. You know, yeah. I mean, we used to use leeches and we used to, you know, do all kinds of things uh, that we don't do now. Uh, and, and it's interesting, there's actually some cases where they do leeches, but yeah. you don't do it as, as the do cure all. It, you don't, yeah, don't do yeah. it as a cure all. You yeah. don't, you don't, uh, you don't, uh, uh, you know, bore a head in somebody's hole, uh, a hole in their head as the cure all. There's maybe a time to do that to relieve pressure, but yeah. we've understood now some of the principles of, of circulation, of infection, of, of sepsis that allow us to treat those conditions with much more understanding so that we can be discriminate in what mm -hmm. we do. And, um, you know, when I think of, of the young men and women that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, uh, uh, and uh, the physical and emotional uh, experiences that they've had, um, and the, and the, and the, throughout the world, you mentioned we, we have to think of ourselves as a global, you know, right. as a global uh, community, mm -hmm. and uh, the torture that mm -hmm. that people have done to other people, and and all justified in their mind in doing mm -hmm. it. Uh, uh, but the, the the effect that that's had on them and their families, I, I, there ha there has to be more hope than we've had. And, yeah. Uh, 
And, and, and so that's what maybe would be good to, I don't know, yeah. talk about. Yeah. Well, I, that's to bring it back to that, yeah. um, I wanted to ask you if, if, obviously, we've talked about the fact that some people just seem to be able to reconnect to something and right. gradually get over things. Right. Uh, and then the people that you see are the people that are stuck in that diagnosis. Right. Um, what do you think, in, if you're starting to talk to someone, what is the most important thing for you to be able to do to get them to reconsider or to reopen their eyes or think again or look, right. look at things differently? Right. That's, a really, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the, the most important thing is to, is to have people start to get a glimpse <clears throat> that of the role of their pow power that they're using every moment, the power of thought, that what they're doing with their thinking um, every moment uh, has incredible impact in, in, in their experience. And in fact, it's really our experience is coming every moment from mm -hmm. by our thought. Now, what, what the traditional, uh, it's interesting, what happens in, in post-traumatic stress disorder is that something happens that's very, very threatening and, or very damaging. And, and the, 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 I always forget the exact word, whether it's ontologically or whatever, but there's, there's some value in that, in that we want the child that puts his hand on, accidentally on the burner to remember Yes. That's not a good thing to do. Right. Right. Yeah. So so that that when there is a is a painful memory, it's encoded in a very powerful way. When there's emotion involved, it's encoded in a very powerful way so that the person could remember uh, could remember that and, and mm -hmm. avoid and avoid that if they're mm -hmm. able to in the future. So so you see that there's some value in, in having that. But, but what we haven't taught people was that a memory is, is a memory. It's a thought. It's not reality. And we have been taking people back into their memories instead of teaching them what a memory is. That it's, it's something yeah. that doesn't exist except as a, as a little uh, chemical thing, a chemical electronic thing on their uh, a memory thing, a chip on their on their brain, mm -hmm. and and it it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean that we have control over uh, every thought that gets triggered because you know if I would have walked on this set today and one of the one of the men that were so kind to to help us out here if one of them would have been a spitting image of uh, a very dear friend that had been killed in an accident when I was in college or in medical school. And, and I, I would have suddenly had something in the pit of my stomach. And mm -hmm. I might have even had some tears coming down my cheeks because those memories had gotten triggered, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I might have had to say to, to people, you know, I need, I need three or four minutes here. I need to just sit quietly. I need to let this reverberate through my limbic system. Mm -hmm. and, and the special part of the brain that handles emotion and, and let it come through my senses. And I know that if I just stay quiet, that it's like a life vest. So you, one of our patients said, you know, I realize this life vest is there. And if I just get quiet, it'll take me back to the surface. Yeah. And, and I would have known that. But, but if people aren't taught that, they, they're terrified by their memories. Yeah. And and uh, they fight them, and and uh, and they innocently, in fighting them, feed them. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've heard me say that really upsetting thoughts are a lot like relatives that come to visit. Right? If you <laughs> yeah. don't feed them, they don't stay very long. <laughs> and and uh, and we feed them innocently. Mm -hmm. So so that um, part. I think that one of the biggest things is to teach people that there is. Uh, a, one, that there is this capacity uh, to regain mental well-being, that it's very real, and that it hasn't been uh, touched by anything. Mm -hmm. And two, that, that their experience of thought is, 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 um, uh, is fluid. 
you know, I, you're, you're wonderful at teaching this as I've taught with you through the years, that it's like, it is like a river. I mean, yeah. the, the, supposedly we think 60 to 100,000 thoughts a day. Yeah. And I haven't heard anybody that can tell me their last 10. <laughs> right? That's you know, true. Right? I couldn't yeah. tell you my last five. Right. <laughs> so, so it's fluid. And the only thing that stops that fluid flow of thought is when we get frightened by them yeah. or, or we uh, get reactive to them. Um, and, and to me, um, th there are these principles that, that I was exposed to uh, back in 1983. Uh, is it okay then sure. to talk about Absolutely. those? Absolutely. And, it, and uh, you know, talk about it. In a, in a short time like this, you and I have both done four-day seminars on yes. this. So, yeah. um, but but that, that there are three powers, if you will, three universal principles that we're all using every moment um, to create our experience. That mind, the mind is not, I mean, at least these are the assumptions that I operate from, and I'm not asking everybody that they have to believe them, but... This is what gives me hope, I guess is what I would say. That, that mind is spiritual. Mind is formless. I mean, that's what I mean by spiritual, mm -hmm. not something airy-fairy. I mean that yeah. it's formless. Mm -hmm. It's an energy. It's mm -hmm. an energy. The mind is an energy. And, and I'll be frank. To me, mind is, is whatever intelligent energy there was even back before the Big Bang. There mm -hmm. was something before there was all this form. Mm -hmm. There was some intelligent energy. And that, to me, everything, ourselves included, are manifestations of that energy in some degree. I mean, this table looks real solid, this, this, but we're told by the physicists, and I believe them, that there's atoms in here. And then inside their atoms, there's electrons going, what, three-fourths the speed of light or something like that. And... I don't know. I haven't seen it, but I believe that that, yeah. that energy. We're all, it, the, this whole show is energy. This whole this whole experience of right. life is energy, yeah. and and that we're using that energy to mani to go through life, and it, it manifests by the power of thought. That every human being is thinking every moment. And you hear people say, well, I don't want to stop my thinking. Well, lots of luck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't do it. Right. We're thinking beings. Yes. And, 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 but whatever we think, then is like our consciousness, the third gift, so there's mind, triggers this experience of thought, and then we're conscious of whatever we think as our reality. Yeah. And so every single human being is walking around with these three elements, mind, thought, and consciousness, making different compounds all day long, right? And all of us, I think, have usually noticed, whether if we've been married or been in relationship with anybody, that we don't all make the same compounds. <laughs> so that we're, we're not always seeing the same thing. At right. least my wife and I, on rare occasions, see things slightly differently. <laughs> right? What's true is everybody is. Sure. And, 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 and so the, the hope is that if people... Just start to have the experience, see, get a glimpse that that's what's happening. I mean, I remember, and I won't go into detail here, but I remember one person who, was, who had had a traumatic event, and it was very uh, traumatic at the time, and she had had many, many, many hospitalizations. And, and I said to her, I said, you know, whatever it is that happened, it's over. over and she at first became very angry with me and she said you don't know anything about what I experienced and she went on for more than just a few seconds and mm -hmm. and I said that's true and and what I said is true also that it's over and that the and I know what you want I said and she said you don't don't even know me yeah I said I I know what you want she said what do I, I said you want to be at peace yeah. I said, I've been a physician for over 40 years, and I've never met a person yet that doesn't want to be at peace. Right. And the only thing that's keeping you from peace is the lack of understanding about how your mind works so that you innocently, and underlined a hundred times, yeah. innocently 
are using this gift of thought in a way that's, that's causing pain for yourself. Um, and as she got a glimpse of that, uh, this woman that had been hospitalized 23 times, um, you know, found peace. And, uh, and, and, and again, she's not the only one. I've seen oh, that no. so many times. I, mm -hmm. I saw a man, uh, uh, can it's okay, a, Certainly. a few a months ago, and he was in his 60s, and he, you know, his, his, um, he had learning difficulties in school, so his, by our, our IQ, the IQ was not real high. He was a very, very heartfelt man, and I felt for him. And he had been sexually abused by a grandfather uh, for many years as a child, and he had carried this through life. And, and it manifested in anger outbursts towards his family and, and everybody. And he ended up, he, he was going to take his life and he ended up in the hospital. And I remember, without going into detail, but basically, I remember when he had that moment of insight and he sat back and he said, you guys, this big grin that kind of yeah. almost went from here to here. And he said, you're right. It's over, isn't it? Wow. It's over. Yeah. And then he, then he sat forward and he said, Dr. Pettit, he said, I just had a, I see that for the last 45 years, I've created incredible pain for myself. And he said, what saddens me is that I see that I've then inflicted pain on other people by the way I was. But, but I also see that I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any better, and 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 he just had tears. He of gratitude, you mm -hmm. know. When so so you, I know that that moment, the potential for that moment to happen, is is always there with every single human being that comes before to sit with me and and and, and thinks that's what's happened in their past precludes them ever being at peace, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's what makes it exciting, you know? Um, Do you feel confident that um, more and more people are going to come around to seeing that this is, a, this is, I, I, the reason I asked this question to back mm -hmm. up is that mm -hmm. uh, I, I do a volunteer group with mm -hmm. uh, women who have right. had a lot of trauma. Many of them are, right. have had trauma because they're married to people with PTSD right. who right. act out. Right. And uh, when I talk to them about these principles and about this hope, you know, right. the first thing they all say is, but, but my husband's in treatment and right. they're making him go over it and over right. it and over it. Right. And he comes back from these groups and he's you know, I, one woman told me, I just don't go home right. the night that he goes to group. Right. And um, I know that's what you referred to earlier when you said it kind of saddens you to see that we innocently yeah. do that. Right. But what do you think it'll take to, to awaken people to the fact that there's a, there's a different way to go about this? Yeah. That's really, an, uh, it's interesting because whatever I've, Whatever I've attempted to do for the last 28 years, it wasn't that. It takes more, <laughs> takes more than what my, not just yeah. me. I mean, you yeah. know, a lot of other practitioners that right. have tried to, to go to people at very, you know, we won't go through the list, right. but at pretty high levels right. and said, just give us a chance. Just give me three weeks with 30 soldiers yeah. and, and let somebody else do the traditional with those same 30 and do it. And, and nobody's ever, you know, they said, well, we, we need... Um, uh, whether you need uh, pilot studies, and, mm -hmm. and we, we we've tried. I, you know, and I have to take. I'm not a researcher. I'm a mm -hmm. clinician, and yeah. and we've tried. And uh, so I, I I don't know. You know, I don't know. I think I think there is some encouraging signs that people are starting to. You know, uh, uh, Dr. Seligman's work on positive psychology, uh, Barbara Fredrickson's work on on that that seeing that people in a positive feeling state. Uh, access a, a deeper intelligence that we yes. would call wisdom, right. that we would call this connection to this universal in, uh, mm -hmm. intelligent energy. That there are people that are seeing that that uh, that 
that may, mindfulness, the mindfulness is an attempt to try to detach people from their content of their from thinking. The you know, of, yeah. So there's a direction, mm -hmm. but there's still, I mean, even this month in my, in my journals is big review articles on re-experiencing. And so uh, people might say to me, they say, Dr. Pettit, there are a certain number of people that get some relief from doing this, from being forced to go through, you know, what, it, what mm -hmm. is your answer to that? You know? yeah. Well, it is okay if I give sure. a shot, you know? <laughs> yeah. First of all, before I would do that, I, my response to people, when people come in and they say they've got this, this issues from this past, that they've, got to, that they've been told they've got to deal with it in order to be at peace. And, uh, and I say to them, you know, to me, the opposite is true. That I'm going to invite you to, to be reminded of some things that you knew but you forgot. And I'm going to put that, what you forgot, in, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, three principles that will allow you to access a place of peace. And once you've, almost like a vertical shift, once you've gotten some distance, like a helicopter, once you've gotten some distance in a state of peace, you will look back at this, quote, traumatic experience, and it, it won't have the power anymore. It, yeah. it, you'll see it as, a, as something that doesn't exist anymore except as a thought. But you can't see it when you're at the same level of it. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, Einstein, as you and I know, I like, uh, love Einstein's wisdom. He said, he said the, the, it, to summarize what he said, he said, the solutions to problems will never be seen at the same level of thinking and understanding that they were created, right? And to some degree, the fact that this person is one of the 10 people that had a traumatic experience that is, is caught in this, there's a level of understanding that talking to them in that state of understanding makes as much sense as somebody uh, trying to defuse a bomb without going to bomb defusing school. Yeah. And nobody would do that. Right. Right? You, nobody would do that. You know, so I tell my patients, they, they come in and they want to talk about this. I said, have you done that before? And they said, well, yeah. And I said, how's it been working? <laughs> they said, well, it hasn't. I, I get suicidal. I, I yeah. start drinking more. I start using drugs because it becomes so painful. And I said, well, I'm going to take you to bomb diffusing school. Yeah. And then we'll take a look at this. If, if you know, you'll, you'll know when the time's right. Well, um, <laughs> That's totally different. Yeah. That's totally different. I, yeah. If I can intersperse, I have a friend that, that always says, uh, that calls me, uh, uh, Bill, do you have time for a story? Uh, but, <laughs> and so I won't tell the story, but I was in, an, I was in the airport one time, and I saw this fellow, because I used that metaphor of Dom, bon, I saw this fellow that had a T-shirt, and on the back of it it says, I, I'm a bomb diffuser, so if you see me running... It would be a good idea to run after. <laughs> anyway, I, I just thought of that. That's a great yeah. T-shirt. But but yeah. I think the idea being that that we have what we've done traditionally, and so people say, well, well, that's what we're doing. I mean, I I I was one time where this psychologist, God love her, and I, you know, this is poli probably politically incorrect, but she got a 2.5 million dollar grant to make a simulator that to put people in that had had limbs blown off while riding a Humvee in Baghdad, streets of Baghdad that totally simulated the streets of Baghdad so they could get back in their Humvee and, and, have, and, yeah. and, and I'm yeah. going, I could have put that $2.3 million to a lot better use, I believe, in yeah. helping people get free from their pain. You know, that, that's really true. And I, it reminds me, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're running low on time, but right. it does remind me of our uh, late friend and, and uh, the, the, the person, the philosophical uh, provider of these principles that, we're, that we talk about, who, who discovered them and saw them and explained them, Sidney Banks. And I happen right. to have his book here, The Missing right. Link. But I remember the first time I met Sid, he said, you know, taking people back into their trauma is sort of like when your child gets out of the bathtub and you say, let me dry you off, and you put them right back in. Yes. And, yes. Uh, 
you know, you'll never be dry. Right. Do and, I have a, a 90 seconds or 60 yes, or not? Yes, yes, indeed. Just, if I, you know, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm no, sorry. not at all. Just that Mr. Banks, and I, I was remiss, I mean, because Sidney Banks, in 1983, when I was exposed to that, and I tell people, prior to that, I was not a mental health professional. I was a mental illness professional. I, I don't remember ever having a lecture in 26 and a half years of schooling on mental health. Right. <laughs> Yeah. But I, have, I had all these degrees that said I was a mental health professional. Yeah. And I knew nothing. I didn't myself. I spent five to nine hours a day in worry, guilt, resentment, upset over analysis, uh, unresolved grief, and then wondering yeah. why I yeah. went in and out of clinical depression. But nobody before Mr. Banks had ever told me that thinking was something that I was doing. Yeah. It wasn't being done to me. Yeah. Things weren't eating on me. I was chewing on them. Yeah. And, and, and people have said, wasn't that disheartening when you realized that your stress was coming from you? And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's the most exciting day in my life yes. because the things that I attributed to my stressed out, depressed feeling were all external to me and I had no control over them. Right. If it was coming from me, there was at least a chance then I might get to see something that will allow me to stop doing it so badly to myself. That's so true. And the metaphor that I use, we spent time at West Virginia University, that where very sadly, occasionally there's, there's mine cave-ins, I'd say that, you know, it doesn't take very many photons of light to give hope to, to a miner who's in a cave-in. No. Because if there's a little bit of light coming in, there's a good chance I'm gonna get out. Right. And when I met Mr. Banks, a whole bunch of photons of light came in that I wasn't not, not going to have to live till the day I died fighting stress, regardless of what's happened in my life. Well, Bill, this is a beautiful place to end, and I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I love your clarity and your passion for this work, and um, just to let our audience know, Bill is one of the greatest contributors to the spread of this understanding, especially in, um, among medical professionals. And um, it's a real honor that we've had him with us. And uh, we're going to have to end this segment, but we have one more chance to uh, talk with Dr. Pettit next time. So thanks very much for being with us.